All right. So we just got done talking about junctional rhythms. So an offshoot of junctional rhythms is talking about heart blocks. Heart blocks are part of the junctional system because we're talking about the AV node. When we talk about heart blocks, we're talking about blocks that are happening within the AV node to some level. Uh, so we'll be talking about the different degrees of how much blocking is happening, but this is all happening within the junction. So let's share screen here. And we'll move forward with heart blocks. Okay, so when we talk about heart blocks, when we talk about heart blocks, we've got differing degrees of them. We are talking about everything that's happening within the AV node. So they're formed when conduction within the AV node coming from the atria is uh, somehow or a portion of being blocked before it gets to the ventricles. So we have, uh, two main types and then some subtypes. We've got first degree heart blocks, second degree heart blocks, and third degree heart blocks. Uh, and their official name, first degree atrioventricular block, or first degree AV block. Um, the second degrees can be broken into two main types and two subtypes. Uh, and then we've got the third degree or what's referred to as complete heart block. So uh, when we talk about the, how much is being blocked. We have a couple of them that we refer to as uh, incomplete blocks and some that we refer to as complete blocks. The incomplete blocks are ones in which we, in which we say that there is some impulse getting through. And in the complete blocks, uh, there is no impulse getting through. In the incomplete blocks, um, we, we really don't have uh, dropped beats, or when we get to dropped beats, um, it's, it's not because of a complete stopping of the system. Uh, and then we get into the ones that have dropped beats uh, and or, or many dropped beats, we start getting into the ones that have a complete failing of the, of the AV node because of the block. So, uh, again, the types of them, if none of the P waves are blocked, then we, meaning if none of the, if none, if all of the P waves have a corresponding QRS complex, uh, then we have a first degree heart block. When we say the P waves are blocked, we mean there is a P wave, but there is not a corresponding QRS complex. So if none of the P waves are blocked, but it's still a block, and I'll define that in a minute, then we have a first degree heart block. If some of the P waves are blocked, then we have a second degree heart block. And if all of the P waves are blocked, then we have a third degree heart block. So in the first degrees, um, what we have is whatever underlying sinus rhythm that we normally have, whatever that is, sinus rhythm, sinus arrhythmia, sinus brady, sinus tachy, it doesn't really matter. Whatever the underlying rhythm is, is what it is. Um, but the first degree heart block has an extended PR interval. So it takes longer for the signal to get through the AV node, but it is consistent every single time. So the PR interval equals the PR interval, but the PR interval is greater than 0.2 seconds. So a prolonged PR interval. Um, in the first degree heart blocks, uh, the first degree portion is an anomaly rather than a rhythm. So in other words, when you do your analysis, you would give whatever the underlying rhythm is as the, as the rhythm, and then you would use the word with and then say first degree heart block. So the first degree heart block is an anomaly. The other blocks are actually rhythms in and of themselves, but in this case, a first degree heart block is an anomaly on top of a rhythm. So you might say, this person has a sinus bradycardia with a first degree heart block, something to that effect. Uh, the delay in the conduction of the atrial impulse, the impulse that's coming from the atria down to the ventricles is long enough to increase the PR interval to greater than 0.2 seconds, but it is consistent. So it is the same all the way through. Uh, the delay most commonly occurs in the AV node or the bundle of Hiss and the conduction to the ventricles will occur every single time. It'll just be delayed. In other words, every P wave has a QRS and the P wave is causing the QRS, but it is delayed every single time to the same level. 
And so in this cartoon, what you see here is uh, a cartoon showing the normal PR interval on the top and uh, a longer delay through the AV node on the bottom. So the delay is specifically within the AV node within that junction. Everywhere else uh, is, has normal conduction. So here you can see that every single P wave has a QRS complex. The distance between the P wave and the QRS complex is consistent in every single beat, uh, which means the P to P interval equals the R to R interval. We just have a PR interval that is extended. And sometimes it can be significantly uh, extended like what you see there in the fourth cartoon picture. Uh, the etiology for a first degree heart block, block is are typically things that are either getting rid of the sympathetic system or enhancing the parasympathetic system or anything that is increasing our vagal tone. There are some other things, hyperkalemia, rheumatic fever, um, aging naturally is going to do it. Um, digitalis is gonna be on our list of almost any uh, arrhythmia that we can come up with. Uh, and there are some MI things that can do it. Um, in a person who is uh, highly fit, uh, especially someone who, um, who, has, who has trained, uh, so professional athletes, this kind of thing, they sometimes have a borderline first degree heart block uh, just because their parasympathetic system is so highly engaged at rest. So the resting heart rate that might be down in the, you know, in the low to mid to mid forties might also have a corresponding extended PR interval uh, because of how much parasympathetic involvement is, is happening there. In the second degree heart blocks, uh, second degree heart blocks are characterized because they have P waves that cause QRS complexes, and then they have some P waves that do not have QRS complexes. So the QRS complex is dropped. So of the QRS complexes that are there, they're being caused by P waves, but there are some P waves that do not have um, conducted QRS complexes. Uh, so kind of the, the bigger characteristic of this is that we see them in groups. They typically find a, a grouping that comes into play where maybe you have uh, three P waves with QRS complexes and then one without, or two P waves with QRS complexes followed by one without, and it's kind of in a consistent pattern. Uh, there's typically only one dropped QRS complex in each group. If there's more, then we, we kind of alter that name just a little bit. The two main types are Mobitz 1, or often referred to as Winkybach, or Mobitz 2. Uh, so Mobitz 1 is a second degree heart, we'll, we'll call it a couple different things. Second degree heart block type 1 is one word, is one name. Second degree heart block Mobitz 2 or a second degree heart block Winkybach are all telling us that it is a second degree type 1. Se a second degree heart block type 2 is referred to as a Mobitz 2. Uh, oftentimes, if you just hear the word Mobitz, it's referring to a type two, uh, because most commonly the type one is referred to as a Winkybach. Then there are two minor types. Uh, there is a two to one untypable, which I'll define in a minute. And then there's a high grade or advanced version of the second degree. <clears throat> so uh, I talked before about the, the difference between the word conduction and the word block. Uh, if we refer to the word conduction, we're saying how many QRS complexes are conducted from P waves, so the P to QRS ratio. Uh, and if we use the word block, then it's how many of those are blocked. So a three to two conduction means that it is a grouping of three P waves and two QRS complexes. The word block refers to how many of the QRS, how many of the P waves are blocked and therefore do not have QRS complexes. So a three to two block would mean that there are three P waves and two of those P waves are blocked and don't get to the ventricles. So you would have three P waves and one QRS, where if you had a three to two conduction, you'd have three P waves and two QRSs. A three to two block means you have three P waves and one QRS. So in the grouping that you see here, uh, that first grouping is a 
three to two conduction or a three to one block. The second cartoon is a four to three conduction or a four to one block. And the bottom one down there is variable conduction or variable block. You can use variable in either of those, both are true. So in uh, Winkybach in type one, <clears throat> you have your underlying rhythm, which will be a, a superventricular rhythm. Uh, typically, uh, we'll, we'll, just, we'll build it into a sinus rhythm. So we have a, an underlying sinus rhythm uh, that has an irregular regularity to it. So we have an irregular, a, a regularly irregular rhythm. Uh, it's regularly irregular because the components where you can see R to R intervals are regular, but it's irregular because we end up with a dropped beat somewhere in the mix. Uh, and you could have any sort of variable conduction slash block. Um, the criteria for it is the PR interval progressively lengthens. This is for a Winkybach. The PR interval progressively lengthens until a P wave is eventually blocked and there is no, and a, and a QRS complex is dropped. The shortest PR interval is always the first one in the, in the sequence, which is always the one that immediately follows wherever the dropped beat is. So wherever the, the dropped QRS complex is, the next PR interval is the first in the sequence. The longest PR interval is always the one that is right before the dropped QRS complex. The largest incremental difference in the PR interval occurs between the first and second intervals. What that means is that uh, the PR interval will grow to its, um, it gets, it, the longest PR interval is the last one in the sequence, but the biggest difference between the change in PR interval is between the first two. And we'll do a few to show what that looks like. Uh, additionally, and this one is uh, can be a little bit confusing, but the R to R intervals actually progressively shorten until the QRS uh, complex is dropped. Mm -hmm. So even though the PR intervals are getting longer, the R to R intervals are getting shorter. The P to P intervals are constant. So our P to P interval is constant. Our PR interval is getting larger and our R to R intervals are getting shorter. Um, the interval including the dropped P wave is less than two times the sum of the P to P interval. And I will sh show that to you in just a minute in the cartoon. So again, the um, difference between the, when the P wave stops and the QRS complex begins continues to lengthen uh, as we walk through it. So every subsequent PR interval is longer uh, until there's a dropped QRS complex. Eventually after the dropped QRS complex, the, the pattern starts over. So if the dropped QRS complex is happening after um, P wave C in this cartoon, um, the next P wave you would see, call it D, would actually look exactly like A. And so we would see A, B, and C just repeating themselves over and over again um, after that dropped QRS complex after C. Um, so the first PR interval will always be the shortest and the last PR interval will always be the longest right before the dropped QRS altogether. And then the pattern starts over again. Uh, yeah. The largest incremental change will be between the first two. So as you see here, the first PR interval is 0.16. The second PR interval is 0.26, and the third PR interval is 0.32. Each one gets larger. However, the difference between 0.16 and 0.26 is 0.10 seconds. The difference between 0.26 and 0.32 is 0.06 seconds. So typically the, the um, largest incremental change is between the first two uh, and then uh, and then it will consistently get smaller and smaller until we have a dropped QRS complex altogether. We have decreasing R to R intervals, and I know this can be a little bit confusing, but our P to P intervals are constant, okay? So if our P to P interval takes X seconds, um, then the first R to R interval is going to be 
x plus whatever the change in the PR interval is. So in this case, our PR interval change between the first uh, PR interval and the second is 0 0.08 seconds. So our R to R interval will be the P to P interval plus the 0 0.08 seconds. In the second R to R interval, once again, it's going to be the P to P interval plus whatever the change is. Uh, and here we had a PR interval of 0.24 and a 0.28. So therefore the change is 0 0.04. So our R to R interval will be X plus 0 0.04. And as you can see, the first R to R interval is 0 0.04 seconds longer than the second R to R interval. And that can, will continue until we have that dropped QRS complex. Uh, the length of the, the pause that we have there uh, is typically less than two times the, um, the P to P interval. In other words, uh, if you're marching out your P to P, your P to P's will march out all the way through. But as you're marching out you, and you get your P to P interval, um, if you match that P to P interval to the R to R interval that includes the drop to beat, you'll see that it is that the um, QRS complex that comes back in is usually before it would have or before it should have. Um, and that's pretty common as well. And so we have here, uh, the various blocks that we have. So the first one is a three to two conduction or a three to one block. The second one you see there is a uh, four to three conduction or four to one block. And the bottom one is a variable conduction or variable block for Winky Bach. But you note that each one has a widening PR interval. Let me be crystal clear here. The P to P interval is constant. So if I walk my calipers from this P to this P to this P, to this P all the way through, that's constant. So the atrial activity is constant. It's the ventricular activity that is not constant based on the partial block that's happening in the AV node. Uh, the, the things that can cause a winky Bach are, as you, as you see here, if you remember the etiology list that we had for a, for a first degree heart block, these are all the same. So all the things that can cause a first degree heart block can actually cause a winky Bach as well. Both of them are um, not strictly benign, uh, but they are not necessarily severe either. There are benign things that can cause a first degree and a winky Bach. There is certainly pathology that can cause them as well, um, but they are not the detrimental pathology that we see in the other blocks that I'm gonna talk about. The second degree type two or the non winky Bach, the Mobitz two, uh, is similar to Winky Bach in that there are dropped QS complexes. However, there is not a changing PR interval. So uh, when you look at these, uh, you can have one or more P waves that are that are conducted, that are that are blocked, that are not conducted. But the PR intervals are constant. So in other words, the P to P intervals will match the R to R intervals that are present. Um, the P to P interval stays constant all the way through, just like it did for the Winky Bach. Um, so you can march your P to P's all the way through the rhythm strip and the R to R intervals will match when they are present. Um, so disregarding the blocked one uh, or, or however many are blocked. Uh, the PR interval is constant. Now the PR interval might have a built-in first degree heart block within this, but it's important to understand that the PR intervals are constant. They are not getting larger, which means also the R to R intervals that are present are constant. So we, we name them in the same way that we named the Winky block in that we can say a 3D2 conduction or a three to one block, four to three conduction or four to one block or variable conduction, variable block. Normally we say those in, in, the, in terms of the block, but uh, as you look at those, again, the difference between the Winky Bach and the second degree type two is that the PR intervals are constant all the way through. Um, a very fast way to take a quick look at this would be to look at the PR interval immediately after the blocked beat and then look at the PR interval immediately before. If they are different, then you're searching for a Winky Bach. If they are the same, then it's likely going to be a second degree type two. Uh, the QRS complexes can be narrow or wide in this particular case. Uh, 
80% of these occur in the bundle branches. And so uh, you end up with a wide QRS complex. Uh, and about 20% of these occur in the bundle of Hiss, which cause narrow complexes. So the majority of our second degree uh, blocks have wide complexes, um, but they can also have narrow complexes. Uh, and it's a pretty bad block. A second degree type two is always bad. So a first degree is sometimes bad, but also sometimes benign. A winky block can be bad, but it's often benign. A second degree type two is always bad. And the concern is how it can proceed to a complete heart block pretty easily. Um, most of the time it's a permanent type of defect that causes this. So most of the time it's a, a permanent pathology that the patient has that causes a second degree type two. Uh, when, so, okay, so there's our second degrees. Then we have some subtypes. So a two to one untypable a two to one untypable heart block. When the conduction ratio is two to one, two P waves and, and one QRS complex, then you can't tell if it's a Winky Bach or if it's a Mobitz two. You can't, you can't tell um, because if we look at it, if you look at the PR interval after the block and you look at the PR interval before the block, they are the same, which meets the criteria for a second degree type two. However, uh, the criteria for a Winky Bach is that the PR intervals progressively get larger. So here's our first PR interval. We don't have a second PR interval, but if, if we had a Winky Bach, what we would see is this would extend out and then we ended up with a dropped QRS complex. And in a Winky Bach, the first PR interval in each sequence is the same. Well, this is the first one in this sequence and this is the first one in this sequence. So that meets the criteria for a Winky Bach as well. So we mean, so we say that those are untypable because we can't off of just looking at the EKG by itself. Well, th there are some caveats to this, but we can't tell which one it is. It could be either one. So whenever you have a two to one uh, or untypable heart block, uh, we want to get a larger strip. Um, if we get a longer strip, we want to try to find any time in which there are uh, two unblocked QRS complexes um, right by each other. If we at any point in time can see two QRS complexes next to each other, then we can check the PR intervals and we can tell which one it is. Because if we have two unblocked QRS complexes, then we can see two consecutive PR intervals and we can see if they are the same or if the second one is longer than the first. If the second one is longer than the first, it's a winky buck. If they're both the same, it's a, it's a type two. And you're not going to ever have a mix of a Winky Bach and a Mobitz 2 in the same strip. So if you ever see two QRS complexes consecutive to each other and we can figure out the PR intervals, then you will know for sure what the untypable portion of your strip actually was or is. Uh, so again, Anytime you can, so over here, if we look at the back half of this, it's a two to one all the way over, two to one all the way over. We can't tell if it's, if it's a Winky Bach or a Mobitz two, but anywhere where we have two QRS complexes together, we can see. So in the top one here, we see two different PR intervals. Therefore, it's a Winky Bach. And down here, we see two PR intervals that are the same. Therefore, it's a Mobitz two. So this back section, of the rhythm that is untypable will always be the same as the first. So we can definitively say this top one is a Mobitz one, and we can definitively say this bottom one is a Mobitz two. You do have to have two consecutive P waves that are, um, okay, so, and then that was for untypable. Now let's talk about high grade or advanced second degree heart block. Um, anytime you have two P waves in a row that are blocked, we would say that's a high grade or advanced heart block, and it's um, significantly worse. Um, these are usually found within um, type twos, but you can see this in a Winky Bach as well sometimes. Uh, but anytime you have two consecutive P waves that do not have corresponding QRS complexes, then we would say this is an advanced block or a high grade block. Um, and that is um, a, a worsening of these heart blocks. Uh, 
in Mobitz 2 in a second degree heart block type 2, the etiology is always bad. Um, it means that there is a damage in the bundle branches or um, possible damage with aging or something, but it is always bad. The heart, the second degree type twos are never good. And we're always concerned about them leading to a complete heart block. So when we look at all of these together um, with uh, both the Winky Bach and the type two, um, they are regularly irregular. The P to QRS ratio is um, variable based on how many P waves to QRSs that we have, how many are blocked. Um, the PR interval in a Winky Bach is variable. The PR interval in a Mobitz 2 is either normal or prolonged, but it is consistent. That's what's important. And in a two to one untypable, um, the PR intervals again are normal or prolonged, but they're consistent and we have to do more work to find out if it, if this untypable is a type one or type two. Uh, okay, and then third degree or complete heart blocks. In a complete heart blocks, we have two completely separate hearts. You've got the atria that are firing on their own and you have the ventricles that are firing by themselves, okay? Um, just a special note that I'll go into at some future time, but if there are the same number of P waves as there are QRSs, but they are not associated with each other, then we refer to it as AV disassociation rather than third degree heart block. There are some subtle differences here. Third degree heart block is a type of AV disassociation, but there are other forms of AV disassociation. So when we talk about third degree heart blocks, we have two different, um, two different rhythms. We've got our atrial rhythm and our ventricular rhythm, and the ventricular rhythm is moving at a different rate, and that is almost always slower than the atrial rhythm. So you're analyzing two different rhythms, the atria and the ventricles. And as you see here, the P, the P to P interval will be the same all the way through. So you'll find P waves that are fused to other waves here and there, but they are consistent all the way through. And our, Q, our R to R intervals are actually all the same with each other, but our P to P intervals and our R to R intervals do not match. They are independent of each other. So there's no communication between the atria and the ventricles. Um, we've got two different pacemakers. We've got one that is supraventricular, i.e. the SA node, and we have one that's ventricular in nature. Um, the atrial, atrial and ventricular rates are going to be different. Uh, there are no capture uh, uh, waves and there's no true fusion waves at all because there's no communication at all. But you might see waves that are um, mesh together. So a fusion of two electrical activities happening at the same time, much like we talked about with the P wave on top of the T wave in a PAC, um, but there's no actual fusion of the electrical activity. Uh, and the key feature is that the, there, there are what you might think are PR intervals are ever changing, but they're really not changing at all. There, there is no PR interval because there's no interactivity between the P waves and the QRS complex. Uh, so the, the P wave has no effect on the ventricular activity. So we've got the uh, atria working independently of the ventricles. Um, in terms of what it might look like, uh, it really just kind of depends on where the ventricular pacemaker is. The QRS complexes could be narrow or they could be wide. They're commonly wide, but they could be narrow or wide depending on where in the AV node, the block actually is, uh, and therefore what pacemaker gets control over the ventricles. Um, but you have, a, you have a atrial rhythm, you have a ventricular rhythm, and then you have what we see on the EKG, which is a compilation of both of those together. And so here are two examples. The top example is one that shows a third degree heart block with a narrow QRS complex, and the bottom one is one that shows you a complete heart block with a wide QRS complex. Okay, so the etiology is a little bit strange with the third degree heart block. You can have some benign reasons that lead to third degree heart blocks. So the, the, the things that are causing first degree and winky box can actually um, contribute to causing a transient third degree heart block as well. Um, 
And then there's a slew of bad things that cause a third degree art block. You should always assume that it's bad, um, but just recognize that every once in a while you can have some things that cause a transient third degree heart block as well. Uh, so keep that in mind as you're walking through here. Uh, the second degree type two is the one that is always bad, always, always, always. Third degree heart blocks are bad from the, the standpoint that they're present, but there can be some transient reasons why, um, why it occurs. So uh, there can be disease processes, there can be drugs, um, or there could be some um, vagal issues or something to that effect that lead to it. Uh, and then of course, electrolyte disorders and disease processes. So if we look at them all together, um, you already saw the, the, this chart with Mobitz 1, Mobitz 2, and, and the 2 to 1 untypable. We had the first degree heart block in there and the third degree heart block in there. So first degree is a normal sinus rhythm with a prolonged but, but consistent PR interval. Um, Mobitz 1, second degree heart block type 1, is a sinus rhythm that has a dropped QS complex and the PR intervals are getting larger until we have the dropped QS complex. A Mobitz 2 or a second degree type 2 is a sinus rhythm that has a uh, consistent PR interval uh, though it can be a normal or prolonged uh, time. Uh, and then eventually you have a dropped QRS complex. A two to one untypable second degree heart block is one that you can't tell if it's a Winky Bach or a Mobitz two because it's a two to one. Um, and a third degree is one in which the atria and the ventricles are completely independent of each other. Uh, and there is no association with the P waves causing anything towards the QRSs. All right, so those are our heart blocks. Uh, we'll, they're an offshoot again of our junctional rhythms. So we'll, we'll talk about junctional rhythms and heart blocks uh, together and, and we'll work on those together uh, because again, the heart blocks are happening within the AV node. All right, uh, next up will be ventricular rhythms. Thank you.